Good evening. This is a meeting of the Scarborough Board of Education. It's Thursday, February 4th, 2016. May I have uh, the attendance, please? Mrs. Bealey. Here. Mrs. Lyford. Here. Mrs. Massengill. Here. Dr. Miles. Here. Mrs. Murphy. Here. Ms. Perry. Here. Mrs. Shea. Here. Ms. Hobbs. Here. Ms. Hartle. Here. Please join me in the pledge. <laughs> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? There is one adjustment, uh, and this is uh, under 10.0 new business, adding a, a new item 10.2. Pleasant Hill School donation. Five point oh, the superintendent's report. Uh, thank you. I wanted to provide an update to the board <coughs> on just a couple of matters before introducing Peter Esposito, who is our new food services director. Um, first, I wanted to um, speak related to the news of a Scarborough youth and a shooting in the community. Um, as you all can imagine, the recent community situation involving a gun and a Scarborough High School student has sent waves of both sadness and concern through our school community and uh, through the greater community of Scarborough and likely beyond. I specifically want to speak to the extraordinary efforts made by the Scarborough Police, the Scarborough High School leaders and faculty, Scarborough High School students themselves, and members of the entire school community to support the student needs that have emerged as a result of the situation. The response to the situation has been timely, measured, um, and effective as the goal has been from the very first moment to create a safe and normalized school environment at our high school and at all of our schools. I'm particularly thankful for the closely coordinated and cooperative work done by Scarborough's Chief of Police um, his staff, the leadership team of Scarborough High School, directly in support of our students and staff. This work has been guided both by internal and external experts on matters such as these. We'll continue to keep our ears to the ground, listening to those experts as well, coordinate our support efforts, and we are uh, very willing and flexible in terms of adjusting our plan accordingly um, with safety, security, and comfort of our students and staff as our primary focus. I want to shift now uh, quickly to an update on the 2017 school budget development. Uh, Kate has shared with you recently, and we are in the process of building the level services budget. Uh, Kate has been working for several weeks independently on salary and benefit projections. Um, she is spending a whole lot of time uh, working with individual building leaders and department heads uh, to review the chart of accounts uh, which each of those folks are responsible for. Meanwhile, just this week, the Leadership Council did begin our conversations around incremental investments uh, that we plan to introduce for the FY17 budget. Once these proposals are formalized and vetted through the Leadership Council, they'll allow us to produce uh, what the board uh, wishes to see, which is a student needs based budget proposal, one which clearly identifies the resources that it would take to move us closer to the goals and targets in the district's 24 month improvement plan. I believe all of you have heard the news from Augusta that for the preliminary FY17 school subsidy figures show Scarborough with a potential reduction of over $1.5 million in state funding from last year's level to this year. Well, the news simply continues uh, the all too familiar pattern of recent years, so this is not new news to us, uh, but that, the, that pattern has left Scarborough taxpayers picking up more and more of the tab for our schools. Um, I did want to insert a warning, however. This is just the preliminary estimate, um, but now is indeed the time to be in conversation with our local legislators, and just a reminder to the board that the legislators will join us um, at the February workshop, which is February 25th. As you know, the first public presentation of the school budget will be part of the municipal budget rollout, uh, and that happens on April 6th. Once we reach that milestone, we should be in a better position to talk about the details of the school expenditure picture, um, and um, we should have 
the information that we need to prioritize and balance um, our need for resources with the community's appetite for, um, uh, for supplementing them with uh, tax dollars. Up to that point, the public portion of the budget process will continue with the school board's ongoing joint financial committee work with the town council um, in developing reasonable benchmarks and metrics for budget growth. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Peter Esposito. He's been kind, of, uh, kind enough to join us uh, today. You know that Peter is our new food services director. This is a shared services contract uh, with Cape Elizabeth. It's new. Um, and we said we were going to sort of see how it goes, um, and we think it's been going awesome. Um, I've asked Peter to speak with you about his vision for school, uh, for school food services here in Scarborough, and also to talk about some of the initiatives that he has begun. In school nutrition, just so that you all remember, we are beginning to see a very encouraging shift to more homemade and locally sourced foods, um, and then I put in brackets, read here, more tasty. <laughs> and, and then I, I was supposed to bring cookies. I sorry, oh. I forgot. And, and, and then it was spell checked, and it said that I was supposed to say more tastier. And I'm like, I'm not saying that. So I didn't. Um, and I just had uh, lunch the other day. We had an important visitor. Uh, we have a new partnership uh, that we are um, cultivating, I would say, with the main uh, Mathematics and Science Alliance and the executive director. Ruth Kermish Allen was here uh, visiting for a good part of the day. And I said, as a treat, you know, we're gonna go over and take a look at some of the STEM areas in, in, um, in, in Wentworth, and I'm gonna treat you to lunch over there. And so she was pretty excited. She said she hadn't had school lunch in a very, very long time. <laughs> and she liked it, and so did I. It was Excellent. delicious. Um, so uh, there looks already to be some savings that we are realizing program-wide. Uh, compared to where we were last year at this time. I think um, that our theory that Im improvement in food quality would ultimately lead to an increase in sales volume over time seems to have some substance to it. Um, and uh, we're going to continue to bet on that. We are spending more on staff wages, but at the same time we're seeing a decrease in the cost of the prepackaged food that we're buying. Um, the fund balance has been positively impacted with our current fund balance slightly improved over that um, of the same time in FY15. So that, as you all know, the historic trend has been that about this time we would be seeing a growing deficit versus a level or improving fund ba balance. So that's very encouraging for us. Great. So Peter, um, tell us what's going on. Right. One of the first things is we were kind of wondering how this was going to work with me doing both. And I said what I was going to do first was to treat it as one district. Um, we're pretty local to each other, Cape and Scarborough, so um, I, I made it a point to be in each district each day. Um, I do spend more of my time in Scarborough, um, and one of the reasons for is I have changed the whole focus of how we were doing things um, between the purchasing, um, the training, and the creating of the school lunch. Um, we've expanded our salad bars, our fruit and vegetables. Um, on a daily basis, we make sure that we have several varieties and try to offer something new all the time. Um, one of the other focuses was on tra staff training. Um, I held a workshop with our staff um, two days in the summer, which they were real happy about coming. But um, at the end of the training, they were very encouraged and they learned a lot. And then we had a cooking competition between the group and they were all happy and it was, it was good. Um, one of the other things that I've done is an initiative with um, cross-training between districts. Um, sometimes it was easier for certain people that I, was, I, I would work with and train them on certain recipes because our focus has been not to buy the pre-package, which would be much easier to do, but to create the recipe that would meet the guideline and create it from scratch, which it saves. And as George said, it's, it's been you know, considerable. Um, one of the things that I did is I sent certain people over to Cape Elizabeth and had them train with our cooks and bakers there and also have sent managers over to kind of see what my vision is in action so they can get a feel for it live. Um, that's been encouraging. The atmosphere in our buildings has changed tremendously. Um, one of the things, um, somebody that was having a hard time, we, we um, 
have trained and I actually spent a lot of time with them and brought them to Cape. And now I'm, I'm encouraged that um, they're doing really well and ha I'm happy with their progress. So that, that part of it is working well. Um, one of the other things, the savings, um, just one, one thing was um, s slowing down on how many times the truck would stop here for purchases. Just by having one drop ship, we would save like 1.5% on the total purchase. So up to date, we've saved like $800 by just having one delivery for each building. So it's just something simple, but it was free money. Um, one of the other things is when I came on board, I think I told some of you that I had met with L.Y. Brook Farm. Um, so we, we got almost, I would say, 80% of our produce up until November from the farm. Um, and a lot of people don't agree that that's, you know, that it's too expensive, but I think otherwise, that it was a good partnership, it was helping the local farmer, and it was also a better product that we were putting out. One of the other things that we did, um, I have an orchard that's not far from my house, and I used to go and pick them up, but we've gotten too big now with Scarborough and Cape. We've saved on the price, and now the farmer comes and delivers them here. So, you know, so we have fresh apples. That's a staple. You know, everybody knows if they come to Scarborough or Cape, they have a fresh apple every day available. Um, one of the other things is we have Maine Family Farms that we've been doing b business with, which is a Scarborough, a local Scarborough um, family that started this company, um, which is um, their products are all sourced in Maine, everything from Maine. So that's our hamburg, our you know breakfast sausage, all that all comes from them. Um, and then the other thing we've. Um, I, I mentioned expanded our salad bars and all that. We make fresh from scratch soups and we dusted off all the baking equipment. Um, some of it, it took a little work to get up and running, but we're making homemade breads, rolls and everything. So we've, um, we've really changed the whole focus of how we're doing things and it seems to be paying off, so. Thanks. Any questions, any discussion? First, I just want to say it's, it's wonderful and so incredibly important. And everything I've heard from very picky children is that it's fantastic. And oh. I can't think of a better way to compliment you than to say that a 10-year-old I know who won't eat anything eats your food. So that's fantastic. That's awesome. That's great. <laughs> um, I, know that the, I know that the Wentworth Garden has, you know, been possibly expanding. Is there a move to have the kids involved uh, in growing food? Oh, uh, well? one of the other, and I didn't mention that. At the beginning of the school year, we actually had some of the students that had tomatoes that were still left in the garden and I brought them into the into the kitchen after you know after the my staff had left and they made pizza and we got actually a donation from um, it'll be pizza dough and they made their own pizza with cooking down the sauce we also had them involved in our harvest lunch where they peeled corn and all that um, they were involved in and then I've I also have done a lot of gardening in Cape so um, one of the teachers at Wentworth has has already hit me up and that's something that's definitely going to be on my list for the coming year, so I'll be there from the from the start to, you know, figure out what we what we want to plant and what we can use. But one of the other things I didn't mention was um, this past month. Actually, my secretary just gave me this. Um, we served 21,000 lunch lunches and close to 3,000 breakfasts. So we did, you know, that many meals in one month. So that's. Um, almost 2,000 more than there was previous. So it seems, to be, it seems to be working what we're doing. And I'm glad that you know, people are enjoying it. And we still get a lot to do, <laughs> a lot more. So. Anyone else? I just want to say thank you. I think that uh, I, I'm in Kiwanis, and I'm over there occasionally on behalf of Kiwanis for the, for the backpack program. And I know that. When I say to people, "How's it going?" Oh, it's great. You got to, you know, this guy and, and the people with whom I've spe have spoken uh, are extremely happy with your leadership and what's going on in the kitchens. Great, thank you. Yes, John. I'm just going to piggyback because I feel like every time the food service comes up, I'm like, I've contributed to those 21,000 lunches. <laughs> yes. Good to hear. Uh, my daughter is in the middle school and raves about your stromboli. She had never had stromboli before you joined. Um, and her friends are always like, what is that? What she's like, it's delicious. So she's like, she's your little PR 
girl Excellent. around the middle school, <laughs> letting everyone need. know. Yes. Last week it was soup. I think the beginning of this week you had soup, chicken noodle soup to, yeah. to die for. Um, and my son, who has food allergies, has always been very hesitant about venturing out and trying yep. anything. But he is right on board. He loves it. So Excellent. it's been great. Thank you. Although my pocketbook is a little less. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but it's good. I'm, I'm happy to contribute. At least you don't have to pack a lunch. I know. <laughs> I like that. That works well. It's a bonus. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, for myself, Peter, I, I also want to thank you. But um, you've had a chance now to take a look at uh, our schools and our equipment. And I'm just wondering, uh, you know, what you're seeing. Are you seeing a need for any particular equipment that, you know, we might be hearing about down the line here? Because you said you had to dust off a lot of stuff yeah. and see if it still works. One of the things that I did notice, I mean, we have this beautiful school in Wentworth, and the high school is pretty well, pretty well set up. There was a few things, but um, like the middle school, I mean, we've had a huge issue with uh, repairing equipment, and I mean, we're upwards of the figure, fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars in just repairs, um, trying to limp things along to try to, you know, make them work, and um, some of it, I, I, you know, it's just aged out and. Um, we just are trying to make do with what we have. So of the pieces that are aged out, do you have a priority? Do you have is I do. something I made in a particular five year, that you feel we really? Yeah, I uh, gave Kate a, like a five-year plan of um, replacement for equipment, and um, we, we're trying to work and see how we can get that out. I'll come share with you. Don't go, don't go away. <laughs> no, <here. laughs> Actually, one of the meetings that I had this week was with Peter and two meetings with Todd, and, and one of the things that we've been talking about has been that we haven't really had a strategic, thoughtful replacement cycle for any of this equipment, and it really goes to the fact that we haven't been using it in the way that Peter would like to use it to do scratch cooking. So it's definitely a topic of conversation, and what we're trying to do is to fold it into the existing numbers in the operating budget, maybe beef those up a little bit for some more preventive maintenance, but also to look at some of our um, capital equipment purchases and Todd's working with us on that. Um, we're also um, working with some of the uh, mechanical services folks and finding out who knows how to fix things uh, <laughs> the least expensively. Yeah. Uh, We've and had that issue this week already. Yeah, yeah we're, we're getting some really interesting quotes on pieces of equipment that Todd and I don't know how to work, and, and Peter does. So it's, uh, it's definitely on, on our radar to make sure that we're modernizing and, and keeping those things moving so that, that Peter and his staff can do what they need to do to make this terrific food for us. Yeah. And one other thing, I just got to give my staff a lot of credit for stepping up and accepting what we've what we've been doing and being on board and really being happy um, now with what we're doing. So. That's great. Good to hear that, Peter. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. That concludes my report. Okay. Is there anyone from the public wishing to speak on any topic on the agenda? <laughs> sure. <laughs> on the okay. Does it have to be on the agenda? Or? You would like to speak? Please come to the podium, state your name, uh, what street you live on, and uh, share some information. My name is Kristen Allen, and I live at 34 Woodfield Drive, and I'm here on behalf of the supporters of Scarborough Schools, and I'm thrilled <laughs> to see you all here, um, the new faces as well as the returning faces. Um, I don't know whether this specifically relates to, I looked through the agenda and I wasn't sure if this specifically related, but um, I wanted to let you all know that we have your back and uh, we want to encourage you to look at what has been cut over the years from the schools because we would like to see something more than level services budgets be passed. Um, Mary and I and um, another gentleman went to the town council meeting a couple weeks ago and we made the same statement and in order for us as a group, as a thousand plus member group to pass the budget this year, we're looking for 
something more than level services. We'd like to see seventh grade sports brought back. We'd like to see foreign languages at, the, at Wentworth brought back. And we realize that that may not all happen in one year, but um, we want you to feel like you've got some supporters behind you and that we're gonna step up. So that's it. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. 6.0 is the chair's report, so I have a few things for you. I attended the joint meeting of the vocational schools that we usually go to. Um, <clears throat> there was an interesting presentation there that was done. Uh, this is a program that is out there that would, you know, a school system would have to decide to join it. It's, uh, and I wish I had, I didn't write down the name of the particular program, but it's something like a gap year or, you know, an additional year. So what it is is that, um, Students who go to the vocational schools during their junior and senior year, if your district was involved with this program and you have a good student, they would have an opportunity to take courses at your high school for college credit because you would, they would partner the teachers at the high school with the teachers at USM or SMCC. Um, it's primarily a partnership with public colleges in Maine. And um, I know in the past we've had other programs similar to this, but mostly it's usually AP English students who get a chance to participate in that kind of a thing. But <coughs> what it would do basically is um, reduce the cost of college credits for a family. And by the end of senior year, a student could have considerable number of credits at the college, at the college level, it, 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 it really I thought was terrific. It's, it's the kind of program that we need to think about um, <coughs> for for additional opportunities for more students, not just not just folk, folk students. But um, I, I thought it was really interesting and wanted to share that with you. Um, I attended a meeting last week on behalf of the superintendent and um, Mrs. Sizemore. Uh, that was a gathering of um, town representatives to meet with Congresswoman Shelley Pingree's DC staff on the topic of what are the needs of Scarborough. And I just wanted to share with you the kind of things that I mentioned on behalf of education, K-12 education here. So I talked about, of course, education funding and the fact that it's not fully funded and uh, Senator Millett was here as well, so she made this a similar kind of a comment. But of course, under our special ed funding, increased special ed needs, um, particularly identification of more students with Asperger's and uh, autism, and the need to have additional funding from the federal government to support special ed, <laughs> particularly 504 funding, because 504 has been a mandate for quite a few years now, and it is not funded by the government, and yet we must provide 504 services. 504 fall, falls outside of special ed. If a child doesn't qualify for special ed, they may still have some needs that have to be put in place in order to provide them equal access to their education. And there's never any money for that, and yet, what it means is that we end up dipping into special ed funds in order to provide for those kids, thus again reducing our special ed funding. So uh, that's another one. I mentioned the school backpack program um, and the needs of our students in terms of hunger in this community. Um, I, I also talked about the need for more grants in this town that would be given to our farmers so that our school systems could partner with the farmers in town in order to provide uh, purchase of um, fresh fruits and vegetables at a lower cost. And we did have uh, a farmer in town who was present at the meeting as well. I talked about pre-K funding. Um, what I'm learning now is that of the schools in the state of Maine that have kindergarten, 68% are offering a preschool program. It's not something we've looked into at this point, but in another year or so, it really should be something that we move forward to, in my opinion, take a look at. So I did talk about providing funding for preschool programs and 
There was a huge grant out there to the state of Maine this particular year, uh, so that a number of districts have uh, chosen to offer pre-K. I also talked about <clears throat> the importance of funding for opiate prevention. That this is a huge issue. We're well, we're well aware of in this state, both opiates and, and heroin. And we need to make sure that we provide programs in our particular middle school and high school on prevention of those, of those issues. Um, yeah, that, that was about it for, for that meeting. Um, so another thing that I wanted to mention to you that, um, you know, I just basically touched on about the 68% uh, of schools looking at preschool. So I've been talking to uh, Susan Reed, who is at the Department of Ed, and um, she handles all the early education programs for the state of Maine. A wonderful resource, and she would be, you know, I, I would love to be able to ask her to come down and speak to us at some date, hopefully this spring to try to give us, get our heads around, you know, if we were to look at uh, providing preschool, what would that, how would that impact? And for us to start conversations about what that might mean if we were to consider that. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated matter. Um, and so we would need to have the background. So I, I'd suggest that maybe we consider doing that. So that's my report. Committee report 7.0. Um, who would like to start? Jody, finance? Sure. <coughs> so I feel like I have a lot to report that we um, had our first, it was our first joint meeting with the town council back uh, January 14th, where the finance committee from the school board and the finance committee from the town council get together, um, also with George and, and Donna's there and Tom Hall and sort of create, um, this first meeting was about creating the norms, confirming our, how things will progress going forward. Um, we finalized the budget calendar, so that's now up on the website. Um, our joint meetings will be happening to the second and fourth Thursdays of the month at 2 p.m. here. We meet here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it seems so long ago, like I feel like I've already said this. So, we meet the second and fourth Thursdays. As we move forward, there'll be more information coming about. Um, we'll also be having our budget forum that we had last year. We'll have that again this year. That's set for April 27th. That will be held at the auditorium. Um, we had a long discussion on the goals and a long discussion on the 3% target and, and what that meant to each of us. And I think we made it very clear and I felt comfortable leaving that meeting that that's a target. That is not, um, it's not a finite number. It's what we're all shooting for. And, and I think looking back at history over the last two years even, two years ago we were at 2.2% as a tax rate and then this past year I think it was 2.6. So I think shooting for the target and understanding if there are extenuating circumstances that come into play that we can't see now, that will have to change. But um, I felt good leaving that meeting. I felt like there was definitely a strong, strong group of people looking to move forward together. And, and I said in our last finance meeting right before this meeting, I'm optimistic and I, and I look forward to how this progresses going forward. Um, we also talked about budget process improvements, and one of those things will be the way the budget is presented to <coughs> the public and to all of us. It'll be in a format that's more like the town was presented, meaning there'll be descriptions and, and sort of background on each school or each department, successes they've had over the years versus what they're looking to improve going forward and, and why they're requesting the funds that they're requesting. I think that is a huge step forward for all of us and I think it will help alleviate the confusion of the budget process, so we're excited about that. And then also we're creating a budget portal on the website where 
all of the information both from <coughs> the municipal side and the school side will live if someone has a question on information in the budget there is a website to go to and all of the information that we've all agreed to and has been presented will be there and and so it's a one-stop shopping um, our next meeting is next Thursday at 2 o'clock and we'll be talking about uh, metrics that both the town side and the school side are looking to focus on in the coming years whether that's student to teacher ratios or per pupil spending we've talked about the the municipal pie you know the budget that we have how is that pie divided and are there ways that that can be altered to help um, <coughs> increase funding to the schools yet not continue to ask taxpayers for more tax money I think that's it very good thank you um, well I'll start right out with my unofficial committee that Jackie always reminds me to tell people about the backpacks um, we're collecting right now for February vacation and the deadline is February 8th <coughs> and if you get in touch with me I'm happy to come pick up from your home or office or you could meet me someplace and I can get your donations I also have a box at my house and I know Becky Bogdanovich collects at her house so a lot of opportunities for you to um, help the kids in Scarborough make it through the vacation week which is hard without school breakfast and lunch for a lot of families so Ellie, I don't mean to interrupt no, you but Saco Benefit Savings will is a collection point also oh that's fantastic and the public library is now for the I think the whole month of February they're already they're already collecting it went into their um, newsletter as well they're collecting um, food for the backpacks for the entire month so some of that will get um, passed on in April but um, there's a lot of places um, as far as the policy committee goes um, our meetings have been sort of preempted a lot by <laughs> superintendent search but we have had some discussions um, in particular some streamlining of the booster policies are on the horizon um, so we're going to continue talking about that um, I went to one of the webinars from Drummond and Woodsum about um, medical marijuana and how that is going to be handled in the schools um, it's actually very different than a medication because it's not prescribed it's a certificate that students have to have and um, students can never possess it teachers and staff can never possess it it's only the primary caregiver um, comes to the school administers it on the spot um, and the child never possesses it and you know that has to be certified by their physician recommends it and then there are certain certifying physicians and it's very complex um, but it's a reality for a lot of students and so we are going to make sure that our policy complies um, it will fall in our regular um, area where we talk about medications at school um, <clears throat> and then speaking about uh, follow-up to your opiates conversation I went to the forum last night in South Portland at the Community Center about the opiate crisis in southern Maine and it is almost overwhelming and soul-crushing the problem and how quickly it has escalated um, <clears throat> I was very proud to see at least 10 I think I've got them all um, David Creech was there David Courier Officer Plord, Leah Zook, Mary Markowski, Christy Zabaznik, um, Nancy Kroll was there, and uh, Chief Moulton was on the panel. And talking about, you know, what we as community members can do, what we can do as school leaders. And I just was so, when we left there, that it seemed so overwhelming because if you look at all the graphs, it's a straight up trajectory. Um, from the number of times that the South Portland this is just South Portland stats they're using the number of times they've had to administer Narcan the number of fatalities they've had the number of um, just pretty much almost every crime they can point to in South Portland leads back to opiates um, and you know some users they're saying five thousand dollars a week is, the, is their habit so every little penny they're gonna get out of somebody's car um, it's just unbelievable and there were um, people there in recovery and mm -hmm. this was the thing that David Creech this <clears throat> speaks to how well he he understands kids because it was a man in his early 20s that was talking and he said the thing that struck him the most was 
um, this guy said what would have made a difference for him is if anybody noticed if anybody had just asked him if everything was going okay because he felt like he was invisible this made him feel better and it just you know spirals out of control so quickly with opiates it's one time and your brain never functions the same way again you never feel normal again it was very um it was overwhelming but i was so happy to see so many scarborough leaders there so we're ready to talk about it in this community and when it comes up people are going to be looking for it um and just to make a connection with kids that was the thing we took away from it just make a connection if it's a kid on your street get to know them ask them how they're doing if it's somebody that you only casually know just make an effort ask how they're doing kids in school talking to each other because that's the difference that kid said and uh, there are a few others there in recovery that said the same thing they felt like nobody noticed that they were being left out or that they were just having a hard time with whatever and that was an easy way to do it and you know what he said the same thing it's from injuries these kids are having injuries they're being prescribed narcotics and then that felt good and so it's finding it next and next and next um <coughs> so it's definitely a crisis but hopefully and that ties into if you're wondering why i'm talking about health safety and security task mm -hmm. force um and then for one other oh and actually this was from all the um people on the panel saying what from your perspective what can we do and every person there that works in treatment law enforcement recovery physicians were there what's the one thing you can do to try to stem this tide expansion of main care mm -hmm. there are bills right now in the legislature um, on the floor right now debating it and they universally said if they could get main care to cover treatments they could expand main care to the single adults that have been cut out <coughs> it would turn it around much more quickly than um, I think they said they only have like 30 treatment or detox beds in Maine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's definitely not enough um, so then on to the calendar committee <laughs> <coughs> turn the ship um, we are hosting a presentation the calendar committee has invited um, start school later southern Maine to come to um, they're going to be in the multi-purpose room at the high school at seven o'clock next Wednesday the 10th and they are going to do a presentation um, primarily focusing on the research surrounding um, adolescent brains and development and sleep and how they all tie together and um, it's all part of our ongoing look at the issues of student sleep and health and what we can do to maybe alter school start times to have the best outcomes so that's the multi-purpose room right across from the auditorium next Wednesday at 7 so tell your friends it's not just about adolescents because if you have a five-year-old they'll eventually be a teenager and it may you know depending on how it all shifts out you know it could be pushing everybody back it could be shifting some schedules around so I think it's important for for um, families of all ages to come and listen to the information I'm done very good thank <laughs> you have anything oh I'm on oh sure absolutely long-range planning met uh, January 20th planning decisions came out um, we've been working with them for well, I guess about a year and a few months so um, planning decisions we contracted with them to do a update on our census in the area of children birth rates things like that so um, we met with them they gave us a lot of information and then our group after planning decisions had left met again and we reviewed some of the information some of you were here last year when Dan Cecil came out um, from Harriman Associates and they had presented us with a variety of scenarios of different things we could do to s the schools improving on them building on them um, you know there were a myriad of options so we're now revisiting as our smaller group now that planning decisions left us with all of this data um, on our population of school children uh, now we're going back through the Harriman paperwork to kind of see what would fit for us what might not work for us and where our student shifts are going and where they're coming from so there'll be an update coming further down the road here where we'll 
after we've gone through and vetted some of these things with the full board. So that's what I have. Very good. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Lyford. Yes, the communications committee has largely been um, busy with getting out the information about the superintendent search, um, preparing press releases, um, and uh, different uh, literature to get out to parents and community members, letting them know how they can take part in the superintendent search. Um, I saw in today's current, our, we're in there, so um, hopefully <laughs> we'll be getting some community and parents' response about possibly taking part in the screening committee, which they only have until February 10th to get an email into Kelly Johnston about that, um, and also letting them know about the focus groups that will be held on March 1st and 2nd. Um, that's mostly what we've been <laughs> busy with. Very good, thank you. Yes, Ms. Perry? Yes, uh, I would like to report that uh, the negotiations team uh, for the board, uh, along with the negotiations team from the Scarborough Education Association, uh, met in a training for interest-based bargaining. It was an extremely productive training. Both sides have agreed that we will use the interest-based bargaining premise as we go forward into negotiations. Uh, we have agreed on who will be our facilitators, and uh, the board's team has met uh, and has developed what we think it would be issues, and interest-based bargaining uh, focuses on issues, and uh, both sides present the issues and try and solve the issues to come to grips with a contract. Uh, we then uh, are going to meet with uh, the facilitator for our team, so to speak, to ascertain that our issues <laughs> are what we wish to really talk about the, so that we, when we start, we will, in fact, uh, know what we're talking about, quite frankly. If this works, and we think it will, the trainer says that we, she got the feeling that we were ready for it, both sides, that we should be able to get a contract with our professional staff, perhaps in one three or four hour setting, and we're thinking about perhaps doing it on a Saturday. We haven't determined that yet, but we've talked about that. So I'm very hopeful, as the whole team is, and we'll keep our fingers crossed. And you'll hear more about that when we talk about some of the issues that can only be discussed in executive session. As far as Maine School, Man Maine School School Boards Association is concerned, uh, there was a meeting Saturday that unfortunately I was too sick to attend. So I haven't had the report from that. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think I'm contagious any longer. So <laughs> you don't have to worry too Not much about that. <laughs> but I will let you know. Uh, I will tell you that, that our uh, leaders there are at the legislature every day advocating for what we need to do for our students. Very good, thank you. And now we have 8.0, our student representatives reports. Emma, would you like to start? Sure. Um, so I'll start with the middle school, and obviously quarter two has come to a close, and we're starting off the second half of the year. And uh, so the first thing that I want to report is that Operation Cupid is going to be taking place on February 10th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. in the middle school cafeteria. and um, it's a call to come support our veterans and our first responders by making Valentine's Day cards for them. Also, Red Storm Strikes Out Cancer will be participating again in Mary's Walk to raise money for cancer research. Um, everyone is invited to join, and the event will be held on March 20th at Thornton Academy at 10 a.m. Uh, the goal this year is to break $100,000, so fingers crossed. And 
Uh, the middle school recently held a B day where students participated in geography, trivia, vocabulary, and spelling bees. And I want to con extend congratulations to all the participants, especially the winners Chris Davis, Sophie Poirier, Will Arpin, Carter Chen, Gavin McLeod, and Colin Wallace. And for the high school, uh, midterms were finished on Monday, January 25th, and semester two has started off to a great start. Um, this week, Key Club and the sophomore class have been working together to put on our first ever winter carnival week. Uh, we've had different spirit, spirit days all week long with various fundraisers to benefit the sophomore class as well as the Eliminate Project, which is sponsored by Kiwanis. Um, tomorrow, there's going to be a pep rally pitting the red and white teams against each other. And uh, each team has, uh, they're made up of students from all grade levels and it's gonna support unity in the school and among different grade levels. Um, Saturday will be our winter ball and that's gonna bring the winter, winter carnival week to a close. Um, I actually wanna ask Lizzie to talk about SHAB, which is a new student run organization in the school, so. So SHAB is, well, it stands for the Student Health Advisory Board, which is a project that myself and three other uh, Scarborough High School students, Aaron McKeown, Sarah Yoder, and K Casey Forrester, have been working to implement. Um, me, Sarah, and Aaron were actually able to go to the Mayan Conference in October, which focused on kind of social issues that needed to be talked about in schools with kind of a focus on drug abuse awareness and how we can implement certain action plans into our school and it really inspired us to sit down and think about what we could do in at Scarborough to kind of tackle these same issues but then we decided to extend it not only into that but to also use it as a platform to talk about issues such as mental health awareness and how we can help students who are struggling with that um, as well as <coughs> fixing kind of tackling the social climate at Scarborough and what we can do to make improvements where there are issues um, but the advisory board is going to be it's student created clearly um, a student led kind of separate leadership group specifically for this and it's mainly to kind of start a dialogue between the students and the faculty members because I'm pretty sure if you asked any Scarborough High School student what they what we need to be able to make stuff happen at our school is to have a way for the faculty to kind of just sit and listen to what we have to hear and so that's what we're hoping to accomplish with that. Um, we are starting an application process for people who want to be part of the, for students who want to be part of the board, um, which is going to be an application and an interview. And then we're hoping to get started with projects um, sometime in March, which is really exciting. It's been an incredibly long journey for us to try to get this started. Um, and everyone at the high school has been so supportive all the faculty members all the students have shown such great interest and we're very very pleased to finally be getting into the kind of nitty-gritty tackling the issues portion so yeah, yeah congratulations yeah. thank you <laughs> and um also at the high school this week uh lizzie and i have been working with mr creech uh to present the two models of the new schedule for next year to the student body uh, We've been presenting them with the two models, and after that, um, we've given the students a survey through their school emails, and uh, basically it's designed to collect student feedback, and that will guide the administration in making the final decision. Uh, the freshman and sophomore classes have heard the presentation and are in the process of sending in their uh, survey results, and I've been collecting those through uh, uh, Google Forms or something like that. I have a whole list of answers on my computer right now. So in a little bit we'll be going through those um, and we're presenting to the junior class tomorrow. Uh, we're really emphasizing to all the students that this survey is not a vote. We want to make sure that they know they're to look at it analytically 
and think about what are the challenges and benefits separately of each model, not just say simply, I want next year to look like this. We want to know why and what aspects of each model are really making them tick or making them think, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Um, so the survey we've asked students to complete by next Monday, February 8th, and then Lizzie and I, and hopefully some other people will help, uh, <laughs> tackle the responses and kind of get some statistics about what they're thinking and um, see if the students have given us any more options to consider, such as um, what challenges and benefits that maybe the staff and the administration haven't seen yet that the students have pointed out. And I actually pointed out one this morning, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but it's going well. So that is all for me. Yeah. Do you have an approximate date set on when you're going to be finished collecting all of your data? Hopefully everyone will have sent it in by Monday. And once we're done analyzing it, I don't know. I'm guessing sometime after February vacation, if yeah. not early March. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, I'll start with the primary schools because I only have just a little short announcement. Um, so the K through two schools were thrilled to host a pilgrim and a Wampanoag from Plymouth Plantation in early January. Um, so the first and second grade students um, were able to participate in living history through hands-on activities, games, and discussions about life in colonial times. Um, and the primary schools would just like to extend a huge thank you to the primary school PTA for funding this visit, because from what I've heard, it was a big hit with the kids. <laughs> um, and then Wentworth, I've actually got quite a few reports. Um, so they recently held the D.A.R.E. graduation for their fifth grade students. Um, this program is a collabora collaboration between school and municipality and is led by school resource officer Rob Pellerin, sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, and officer Eric Greenleaf. Um, and they are very grateful for their support of the students through this really important program. Um, and then the Wentworth Annual School-Wide Storytelling Festival com competition is well underway. Um, and the storytelling and literary skills of the students is as impressive as ever. Um, so there have been a couple concerts, winter concerts, going on at Wentworth. Um, the Mrs. Drew's first, um, first concert, the third and fourth graders. Um, it says the students from Mrs. Bayou, 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 Bayou. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> Mrs. Tromley, Mrs. Delcourt, Mr. Kelly, Miss LaSalle, Mrs. Ant, Mrs. Huth, and Mr. Slotman's classes had their winter concert on Wednesday, January twentieth, at the high school. Um, and then the second, third, and fourth grade winter concert was students from Mrs. Davis, Mrs. Maddock, Mrs. Albert, Mrs. Zinchix, Mrs. Kelly, Miss Chin, Miss Hewitt, Mrs. Tui, and Mrs. Dean's classes, which was January the 25th. Um, there is the Coats for Kids program going on at Wentworth right now. And it says the Blue Learning Community did their community service Coats for Kids pro coats for kids and collected 167 coats along with many pairs of snow pants, mittens, gloves, and hats. Um, and then there's the Scholastic Pajama Collection going on right now. <laughs> so it says, this year the Green Learning Community teamed up with Scholastic Reading Club Great Bedtime Story Pajama Drive, which benefits the Pajama Program, which is a nonprofit organization that provides new pajamas and books to children living in group homes, shelters, foster care, and orphanage orphanages, sorry. Um, it says they asked families and students to participate by donating a new pair of pajamas, bringing in a $1 donation for the Pajamas for a Cause event, which was held on December 11th, um, and then wearing pajamas on December 11th, and all proceed, proceeds will be used to purchase pajamas for the pajama program, um, or do both. Um, it says, during the week of December, the pajamas started coming in. On December 11th, they received $665 and 99 pairs of pajamas from the students of Wentworth School. Um, three of the faculty members spent the entire $665 buying an additional 103 pairs of pajamas for a grand total of 203 pairs of pajamas. Excellent. Yes, and it says the pajamas were picked up by the Portland Police Department and distributed to local group homes, shelters, and foster care families. And it says the Green Learning Team enthusiastically look forward to this wonderful community service project next year. 
And then Mr. Fletcher's third and fourth grade winter concert uh, says, the students from Ms. Coate, Mrs. Hayes, Ms. Hickey, Mr. Sellinger, and Mrs. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Evan Ho? Evan Ho, I think. Okay, so. yep. This classes, um, actually, they just had their winter concert on Wednesday, February 3rd at Scarborough High School. So there you go. Quite busy. Very. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. I'm, I'm so impressed by all the things that we do have going on, not only from the board side, but everything that's happening in the schools and particularly with the program that you're getting started at the high school. That's mm -hmm. really terrific. Thank you. <clears throat> so 9.0, we have a recognition. I would, uh, just a couple of recognition items, and uh, one relates to um, uh, selection of candidates for the United States Presidential Scholars Program. Uh, the U.S. Presidential Scholars Program established in 64 by executive order of the President to recognize and honor some of our nation's most distinguished graduating seniors. And uh, basically students have the opportunity to become U.S. Presidential Scholars based on three paths of accomplishment. The majority of scholars are selected on the basis of broad academic achievement. Approximately 20 students are selected on the basis of their academic and artistic scholarship in the visual arts, the performing arts, or creative writing. And beginning in 2016, approximately 20 additional students will be selected on the basis of their ability um, and accomplishment in career and technical education fields. So it's really been broadened, which is quite nice. And I'm pleased to say that we've got two candidates in our district um, at the high school. And that's Sarah Linehan and Elliot Youth. So congratulations to them on becoming candidates for that very prestigious award. Um, also at the high school, uh, we have uh, uh, been uh, recognizing Cameron Jury, uh, Scarborough's youngest published author. Uh, Cameron, uh, Cameron Jury, a freshman at Scarborough High School, creates stories with the same zest many students may reserve for the sports arena or concert hall. Uh, throughout middle school, she participated in various summer camps with the Telling Room, which is a nonprofit writing center in Portland, offering programs for all students from ages 8 to 18. While in eighth grade, Cameron applied for the Telling Room's highly selective Young Emerging Authors Fellowship, where stu four students spend a full year creating and publishing their own books and working with individual mentors. Cameron worked with Katie Kelleher, who is an editor for Maine Magazine. And at the beginning of this school year, her book, Cameron's book, um, Because Why Not Write, was published locally. So we congratulate her and recognize her. And Emma already talked about B-Day. And I was having a conversation with Mrs. Hathorne. And she said, Dr. Entwistle, we had B-Day. And I said, you had B-Day? And she said, yeah. And I'm a beekeeper, and I was like, I said, Barbara, you know that, I mean, why would you have bee day, and why would I not know about it? She said, no, no, no. It's not bees, it's bees, like you explained. So thank you for covering that item for me. All right. I thought they were talking beekeeping without me. And 10.0, um, new business, 10.1. The minutes of January 21st. Move approval is printed. Second. Second. Any discussion, any corrections? Seeing none, all in favor? Six plus two. And Seven. ten. No. I'm abstaining, I oh, wasn't sorry. Seven. One abstain. You're helping to count, that's nice, okay. <laughs> 10.2, Pleasant Hill School has a donation to discuss with us. Yes, uh, we do. I think it's um, a terrific other. No, I got it. I got it. I got it. Um, um, another uh, terrific donation from Bob's Furniture Warehouse for fifteen hundred dollars given to Pleasant School as part of the Random Acts of Kindness program, and can be used um, in the way that uh, uh, Pleasant Hill wishes to use it, which is kind of. Um, kind of nice. It's money with no strings attached, really. So I, my recommendation is that the board would approve that um, donation. 
Move approval. Second. With great thanks. All in favor? Seven plus two. Very good. 11.0. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? Pursuant to 1 MRSA, subsection 4056A, to discuss a superintendent's annual performance review, not to return to public session. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? 7.2. 7 plus 2. We are adjourned. <laughs>